what has been a huge tailwind is slowly starting to turn into a headwind. There's a demand shock out there, and we've juiced that demand shock with the last round of stimulus checks. Equities respond generally positive to inflation until it hits a certain level. We think the markets are going to become more challenged going forward. Don't miss out on the bigger picture here. The fundamentals are damn good. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramas, and Tom Keen. A special day for Global Wall Street. It is a day where the bond market is on the move. Katie Lines in for Jonathan Farrow. He's on assignment, and it's a really interesting market. We'll get to the equity story in a moment with equities up, NASDAQ up, and that. Lisa Bramowitz, I'm thrilled to speak to you about this. Three standard deviation move and the two cents spread, flattening, flattening curve, the real yield almost a jump condition to a new negative statistic. And what absolutely stuns me here, and John Authors nails it, it's a hawkish dawn. A hawkish dawn for central banks globally. And I look at Canada, actually, setting the tone for the market yesterday, surprisingly ending entirely their quantitative easing purchases, bringing forward the rate hike expectations. Are they a harbinger of what's to come at other central banks, or are they independent? This, to me, is one of the key questions on the precipice of the ECB, on the precipice of next week's Fed meeting. Lisa Publishing moments ago, George yeah. Saravellis at Deutsche Bank, and he says, look, the macro analysis, we'll do it. We'll do the ECB today. Day, out the window. This is about value at risk. What that means is positioning. How out of whack, how out of kilter, Lisa, is the street? Yeah, basically, he was saying over the last three days, we've seen unprecedented volatility in the short term rates of all of the different and developed markets globally. I mean, really, if you look around the world, shocking moves, talking about standard deviations. How much is this a complete inability for Wall Street houses to gauge central bank reaction function at a time of faster inflation and slowing growth and a feeling of we're uncertain as to what is causing this inflationary push, Tom. We'll do the data in a moment. Kaylee Lines, Amazon and Apple, the advantage of going after Microsoft. I'm sorry, I love what Jeffrey said. Microsoft, simply incredible. Do you anticipate in your reading an incredible afternoon for Cupertino? Well, our analysts here at Bloomberg Intelligence say the fact that Microsoft was so strong on the cloud actually may bode well for Amazon because in terms of the cloud, they kind of have a duopoly in some respects. So that could bode well for Amazon on the supply side. But talking about, as Lisa said, what's causing inflation, supply chain issues could be a problem for both of these companies. Amazon, it's not even just a question of getting materials. It's also a question of labor pressures and having to pay workers more to get deliveries within two days. And for Apple, I mean, I don't know if you ordered an iPhone 13, Tom, but there's a good chance that you haven't had. That you uh, no, we don't, your no I don't have it. I got, I'm ordering. Problem. This is my reality, folks. Count them. Four new iPhones. Yeah, How many do I place. have? Zero. It's a there crisis. They're crisis not there in the right Keen now. household. <laughs> Let me do the data right now. Please. We're going to get to uh, Lisa's brief. Futures up eight. Dow futures up 27. NASDAQ 100 on a tear up 8.88%. Off the bottom, that's a Faroian draw up is what we call that. The VIX pulls back 16.83. A little bit of tension there. The yield, well, we could go all day on the yield. The 30-year bond from 2 point whatever down to a stunning 1.95%. Uh, a lot of of, uh, dynamics there between the two-year and the 10-year, call it 29 basis points over the last week to see that movement um, as well. I'm going to leave it there with Brent crude off $3, $83.44 from the peak. I need to be brief. <laughs> Kaylee needs to be brief. Lisa, <laughs> please. please put us out of our morning right, misery. I'll, I'll put you out of your misery or perhaps put you in new misery. There is a question of the day in my mind, the question of the week and heading into next week, which is how do central banks globally grapple with much higher inflation, accelerating inflation at a time of slowing growth, not stalling growth, slowing growth. This is the conundrum as we talk about the potential inflationary pushes. Is it demand side? Is it the fact that we all have so much money or is it supply side? Is it the supply chain disruptions that Kaylee was talking about? At 7.45 a.m., we get that ECB rate decision and basically you were looking at uh, the inflationary rate rising to the highest level since 2008 in the eurozone. However, there are stagflationary type of feelings there in terms of trade, in terms of how much things are costing versus a labor market that still is stalling out in some areas. In the United States, it's a different story. 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. initial jobless claims. <coughs> the expectations is for a new sub-300,000 print, another new low since the start of the pandemic. This is possible. 
positive. However, at, uh, we also get the GDP for the third quarter at the same time. This will be potentially less positive. I want to point to the Atlanta Fed GDP Now forecast. Good. To me, this was shocking. The idea that we were looking at the potential for 4% right. growth that has now come down to 0.2% growth for this Fed tracker of potential GDP. What does that mean? Is this pression? Is this off? How does this cohere with earnings that continue to come out blockbuster after blockbuster at a time when other gauges show a very different picture? And after market, we get earnings from Apple and Amazon. Nobody Just cares. to give you a sense, if you don't care, a lot of people do. They're massive in the indexes. It's interesting to see how much they've underperformed, frankly, as we've gone on with this year. It's only been a le less than 13% returns for Apple only, I say. Uh, Amazon up about 4%. How much of the supply chain disruptions have been priced into Apple and how much, frankly, have people already looked at the labor disruptions for Amazon? How much has been priced in? Right. What do they see going forward? Tom? Many on the sell side, of course, way out front with price targets that are up, 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 and we'll see who will recalibrate. Look for the close this afternoon on radio and television uh, with that. Right now, and this is really timely, Ibrahim Rabari joins us. To say he's head of FX analysis at Citigroup doesn't do justice to a large and holistic global view. Abraham, I want to start with a great essay by John Authors of Bloomberg Opinion, where he talks about a hawkish dawn. Are we at a hawkish dawn? Thank you, Tom. It's great to be with you uh, from London. And I, I do think that we are, and, and, and markets are grappling with what is, uh, I think, accurately described as a bit of a regime change particularly for the inflation outlook, and that that is uh, inducing central banks to look for some optionality in tightening policy, if not now, then in, in the months to come. So I think we will see the hawkish trend continue across global central banks. But to anticipate the discussion, we think the ECB may be a bit of an exception there. All right, so let's just go first to Ibrahim on what you were saying, a regime shift, particularly when it comes to inflation. Does that mean that you see this as being more persistent or persistently transitory uh, than some people are expecting in places like Canada, in the United States, where the central banks uh, are expected to hike more quickly than they say they are? Yes, so we have a lot of sympathy with the view that the combination of factors, supply constraints, generally still relatively a positive demand, but also generally fairly tight labor markets and uh, inflation expectations moving up, that they could turn out to uh, last a little longer at a minimum and possibly much longer than we expected not so long ago. So in that stagflation narrative, we certainly have a lot of sympathy with the inflation side, and we have at least some openness towards the idea that growth is going to come down a little bit lower uh, than many had penciled in. Well, we know Christine Lagarde and the ECB have stuck with their transitory messaging and that this inflation, too, shall pass. When you think about the fact that other central banks globally are moving towards tightening, and as you said, the ECB kind of an outlier in that, does that mean that the euro is going to continue to lag? In a nutshell, yes. So we think that the euro is challenged by the combination of some signs of slowing growth, including in the survey data in, in, in Europe, but also ultimately because of sensitivity to global trade and Chinese growth, mm. we do have a very significant shock from uh, rising energy prices for a major energy importer uh, that will hit uh, both the terms of trade and uh, real incomes in, in the Eurozone uh, as well. And in an environment where yields are going higher, they tend to lag in Europe <clears throat> in general. And we think these three factors together have the potential to push Euro dollar in particular uh, yet further down in the months to come. Ariam, I want you to talk about a philosophy that's been out there for years. And folks, there's a lot of re uh, Latin phrases thrown about this. But all you need to know is ex post is basically a tone of after the fact. Ebrahim Abari, Christine Lagarde today, and frankly, all the others, they've all got to operate after the fact. The, 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 the Bank of Japan proved you can't get out front, right? So I do think what makes the situation particularly difficult for the global central banks is, in fact, that it's not just that inflation is going up, but the uncertainty about future outcomes is really much higher than it used to be. And it's, again, it's really that uncertainty that is driving central banks to try to be a little bit preemptive or proactive. They're not truly preemptive or proactive because, as you said, a lot of the developments have already taken place. But by their own standards, they have to bring forward their... Uh, options to tighten policy without a commitment, by the way, but at least to, to have the, the, the opportunity. Does that, in the end, have to be followed through with persistent tightening? I would say 
it's more likely than not, but far from certain at this stage. Ibrahim, thank you so much. Ibrahim Rabari joining us today from Citigroup. Thrilled to say Greg Peters will join us here. Bill emailed in last night and said, get Peters in. <laughs> uh, we're thrilled to say Greg Peters of PGM will be with us here in a bit. Lisa, it is absolutely extraordinary. Let me explain this as simply as I can, Lisa, and give us uh, your view. And the concept that I have is a two-year yield that is up eight or nine basis points in a 30-year bond betting on a slowing economy and disinflation coming lower in yield by a solid 20 basis points at the same time. That's original, isn't it? We really, I mean, it's a rare occurrence, I guess I should say. So bond traders are much more pessimistic than stock traders <clears throat> because the economy is not the market. I think that that is frankly the conclusion. The idea, the Fed's hand will be forced as we saw the Bank of Canada's hand seem to be forced. Perhaps the ECB has a different dynamic that they're dealing with, but when they hike rates, they are going to be hiking into the same environment that we left off before the pandemic. The idea of an aging demographic, the idea of more debt, the the idea of growth that isn't necessarily going to keep up this acceleration that we had seen immediately post pandemic Tom and I think that that's the message the question is slowdown is not recession how do you sort of parse out the difference between the two well in the slowdown I mean Kaylee let's you know I mean we're focusing on the bond market here because that's what global Wall Street wants to do right now I'm sorry this earnings season like last earnings season is killer yeah, they're killing it, Tom. And it's a question of how these companies have been able to exercise their pricing power and retain margin. Bank of America putting out research yesterday that margins are actually expanding on average in most companies across industries, including for staples, which we thought would be ultra sensitive to inflation. Mm. So all of the concern about a, parcel, a potential margin squeeze out there, yeah. companies are proving those strategists wrong. Now it's going to be interesting to see. We are thrilled that Kaylee Lines is with us. We're even more thrilled John Farrow is not with us. That's a Ooh, makes burn. her just, no, but you know, I mean. <laughs> Are we going to sure miss his watching. expertise on the ECB? Let's talk Maybe, about the Dow. We'll talk know. about the Dow all day. We'll talk about the Dow all day. We'll do that. Stay with us. Greg Peters coming up here in a moment. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. President Biden heads to the Capitol today to brief House Democrats on his social spending agenda hours before he heads to Europe. The president wanted to have an agreement when he arrived in a Rome for a Group of 20 summit, but House and Senate Democrats can't agree on how to increase taxes to pay for the measure. In Taiwan, President Xi Langwen says she has faith the U.S. would come to the island's defense if China tries to invade. That's a comment that's bound to up Beijing. Tsai told CNN the threat from China is increasing every day. She also confirmed the presence of U.S. troops in Taiwan. CNN says there are fewer than three dozen American service members there. The price of European natural gas and power fell today after signs from President Vladimir Putin that Russia will send more gas to the continent next month. Putin has told Gazprom to start refilling its European gas storage facilities November 8th. Benchmark Dutch gas for next month's delivery dropped as much as 12%. Hong Kong is preparing to roll out a coronavirus booster shot. Tops on the list, the elderly, those at higher risk of infection and people who are vaccinated with China's Sinovac biotech shots. The Sinovac injections are seen as less effective than other vaccines. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. Now's the wrong time to raise taxes on anybody, whether it's billionaires or average consumers. The problem with the billionaire tax is, one, it probably won't raise much money, since a lot of this money will be given away to foundations, uh, so it won't be taxed. The other issue is it's probably unconstitutional. And the third issue is it creates very, very bad incentives.
The former Secretary of the Treasury on Riyadh Standard Time with Gamal uh, yesterday, I really thought it was really quite something to, to listen to Secretary Mnuchin talk about something that six hours later seemed to evaporate <laughs> off the landscape. Lisa Bramwitz, Kaylee Lines, and Tom King, John Farrow on sabbatical, uh, beginning a sabbatical, I should say. I, you know, I think it's, uh, Lisa, I mean, what do you think, Lisa? Capri? Yeah, definitely I mean, Capri. I, you know, two day Capri trip. It's not too he cold for it. Capri. You know, he's going to go check out uh, to take a tour of Campari Factory. It's going to work out. He got the Gulf Stream. Jack mm -hmm. Fitzpatrick has never had the surveillance Gulf Stream <laughs> and joins us now from uh, Washington. Jack Pager and Sullivan in the Washington Post, I guess, driving fo forward the conversation. Help me with, and Valier nailed this yesterday, a revised framework. Deconstruct for us right now this new phrase, a revised framework. So Democrats are trying to come to an agreement. They want to come to an agreement today, preferably by this morning when the president is supposed to speak to House Democrats on not an actual full bill, but it, uh, basically a list of what they want to put in the bill, which is the, the important part. That means settling on exactly what the tax measures are going to be. That would also mean, though, they have to calculate how much revenue that gets them and <clears throat> see what they can fit in here. So yeah. the key questions right now are, what exactly are the tax measures they can agree to? It sounds like they're good on the corporate minimum rate, not good on the so-called billionaire's tax. After that, they can figure out what's in and, and what's out on spending, and it does sound like the uh, the paid leave provision is out, but it's going to be on the basics and not some final bill okay. that's ready for a vote. So right now, as the president goes to Rome, we're thrilled Anne-Marie Horton, Maria Tadeo will darken the door of the G20 meetings. Jack, are the, are the, whip, are the whips whipping this morning? I mean, are they actually, <laughs> like, counting votes? Well, there's nothing to whip specifically, but we're, we've been in a months-long process where they're figuring out if there are any objections, uh, because Democrats have said that you know almost anyone among them can be the Joe Manchin type figure and hold this up if they want to be. It's less a whip count and running things by the key members, including <coughs> Manchin. Now Senator Cinema has uh, some pivotal views on the tax measures. But also, they, they are running this by and seeing if there are objections. There was uh, opposition by uh, Richard Neal, the House Ways and Means chairman, to the billionaire's tax. Uh, so they, they are running essentially this list by everyone, but they're not really to a, a true whip count just yet because there's no bill. Okay, <laughs> Jack, there's no bill really sums it up that basically we're talking in theory and talking about theory. Uh, Kristen Cinema actually gave a wish list or a list of provisions of tax uh, measures that she'd actually be comfortable with and she passed it around and said if you can satisfy these then let's talk what was on there that you think has the greatest sticking power as we get perhaps a draft of a bill the key one was this 15 percent corporate minimum rate uh, I believe according to lawmakers what they're talking about is for uh, corporations with a billion or more in profits, that's what they've discussed. She can get on board with that. That's a, a, a expected to raise a few hundred billion dollars over the course of a decade. Uh, she appeared to be okay with this billionaire's tax on, on unrealized capital gains, but that got opposition from elsewhere. And potentially, and this one is a little vaguer because, it, again, it's not a bill and it's, there, there hasn't been a real proposal out, some sort of 3% surcharge tax on uh, wealthy earners. It would be different uh, than the high, the raising the highest income tax rate, but adding some beyond a certain threshold of about a million dollars. That hasn't really turned into a concrete proposal just yet, though. All right, Jack, so we've talked about the moderates in the Senate. Can we talk about the progressives in the House? Because they were making a lot of noise, and I feel as though they've gotten a lot quieter, even though the social spending that is really key to their agenda seems like it's going to be whittled down. Yeah, well, they have had their say on exactly what they want to be in the bill, uh, on the reconciliation bill, on the front end, and, and really helped shape that. Now that's why this is kind of getting funneled through the lens of the moderates. But progressives have been very vocal on the strategy of how to pass this, because leadership, it seems, would like to pass the Senate-passed infrastructure bill through the House and actually have that become law if they had the votes. But there is opposition from the progressives 
to do that mm -hmm. until they actually have a bill <clears throat> that they can vote on on the social tax and spending measures. So they are uh, going to try to hold up the infrastructure measure until there's a real concrete deal on everything else. Wow, good luck want. with that. Jeff Fitzpatrick, thank you so much. This would be kind and eventful Thursday uh, in Washington. We need to get back to the bond market. Yes, we've got Apple, Amazon. We'll talk about that uh, along the road, the surveillance road this morning. But uh, Lisa, I'm sorry. We need to reset on the bond market. Let me give you some data, uh, Lisa, and you go with it. The two-year yield, 0.55%. The 30-year bond, well under 2%, 1.95%. For those on the teeter-totter, short-term yields up long-term yields down. Lisa, what does that signal? It signals slower growth, and frankly, it signals that the economy <clears throat> is heading toward a rough patch that perhaps people are not pricing in, at least in the equity market. And I think that this is the divergence that people are struggling with. Why are bond uh, people in the bond market so pessimistic? I know you guys ask this <clears throat> to me every day. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, people say, well, the economy is not the market. Well, then what's really the true reflection of what's going on okay, on the ground, great. Tom? You know, Kaylee, I just don't get it. I'm going to be watching Fox Sports 12 noon Saturday, Michigan, Michigan State, best football game in college football in a jillion years. Nobody in that stadium, <laughs> what, 100,000 people? Nobody's as gloomy as they are watching surveillance. Yeah, okay, I think Lisa's point about whether or not the bond market and the equity market are sending divergent signals is an interesting one, and it's something that has come up time and again over the course of the pandemic era. Does the bond market know something that the equity market hasn't figured out yet, or is the equity market solely focused on earnings growth and companies' resilience in the face of supply chain pressures, and yes, maybe <clears> even <throat> growth that is slowing down? But I would also note a lot of the move in the bond market has come from higher inflation expectations. It's the break-evens. Real yields are still very, very negative, and in an environment where you still have well, deeply negative real yields can risk assets still do okay for radio now we walk through the yield real yield equation this i mean pharaoh does this every friday look for the real yield who's doing who's doing the real yield tomorrow i Pharaoh's think taylor's doing it <laughs> taylor riggs is doing it yeah she would know a bond if it hit her over the head let's do the math nominal yield lisa minus inflation is the real yield the residual right yeah Correct. Which of those three things matters? Well, right Nominal, now. Nominal, <laughs> inflation, or, or residual? I mean, it all matters deeply for all those people in the stadium who are going to be uh, feeling pessimistic as they watch this and then optimistic as they go to the field. Listen, I will say this. The bottom line is this. Inflation is rising. Can we continue to maintain growth despite the fact that inflation is going up? So far, earnings say yes, bond market saying no. And these are the questions that we need to answer. I mean, we're going to have to see. It is interesting, and we'll do more data checks here. I really want to emphasize, for those of you who hung up on equities, the bond market today, absolutely fascinating. Futures up eight. Dow futures. Good morning, Mr. Farrell. Dow futures up 24. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance. It is an eventful Thursday. Michael McKeon with Claims Later. That has been a wonderful trend of job creation in America. We're looking at the bond market. Really extraordinary right now to search for one yield. I've got to go to the two-year yield. John from Coventry emailed in and said, Tom, you're not quoting the two-year enough. 0.5483%. He's not wrong. Two yeah, he's not wrong. Oh, thank you. It's good to know that. <laughs> right now, in what we're doing here away from bond market shenanigans is really looking at the tech juggernaut and how it folds over into the rest of the stock market. Katrina Dudley at Franklin was iconic at Federated for her analysis of technology, and we're thrilled she could join us uh, with Franklin Mutuals uh, today. Katrina, I want to talk up about something as basic, CFA 1, of persistency of free cash flow. Do we massively misjudge the generation of cash and the use of it for shareholders? Um, if I take a look at free cash, it's one of the key metrics that you have to look at at a company in terms of your know, assessing the, the stability or assessing the sustainability of their competitive advantage. We're value investors, but we spend a lot of time looking at cash. We take it from the net income level and we look at what are all the people that need to get paid, um, you know, the legacy restructuring right. charges. 
yeah, so there's so many things um, and so many parts of that cash flow statement that people just completely ignore. Um, so I think that people also very much get confused about a resilient net income number and they forget about looking whether or not that is a resilient free okay. cash flow number. So, so I, I love that you're going all Graham down and coddle on me. Lisa, that's the iconic textbook out of Columbia from a million years ago. Mm -hmm. Katrina's read six volumes of it. Forget about it. Move up the income statement and can you partition the tech juggernaut over to the rest of American industry? Do we just simply underestimate in this great bull market the ability to make profit? Um, I think in a tech bull market, what people are now really focused on is the sustainability of that profit stream over a long period of time. And we're also focusing on the role that interest rates and inflation are going to play. Because when you have such high multiples of earnings, which a number of these tech stocks are trading on, or you have stocks that are actually not even trading on earnings, they're trading at 30 times sales, you know, interest rates become something that's very, very sensitive. Because on a DCF valuation, you're looking at those terminal values and rising rates and negative for terminal values. Well, Katrina, this really goes to the heart of the question of the U.S. versus Europe, where there's a greater tech dominance excuse me, in the United States versus Europe. And there also is this feeling that there is a different, more stagflationary-like kind of headwind facing Europe. Is the cash persistency of European companies different than that of the U.S.? So the, Europe doesn't have the same level of technology companies, but it does have a number of very strong companies there, from a Cap Gemini to a Software AG. Um, SAP is another big juggernaut. I think you know, most companies can't function without an SAP supply chain solution. So I think that Europe does have a great constitution of technology companies, but it's not the dominant force or a dominant percentage of their markets. What they do have is luxury stocks, which are the, the tech stocks of Europe. And you think of the Louis Louis Vuittons, um, you know, Cartier and all of those very strong brands. And that is the technology equivalent in Europe. Um, I would say, however, that those brands have got a lot longer longevity. They've been around for multiple, you know, new centuries often. Um, and so their ability to generate free cash flow has been tested time and time again. And the stability of those franchises, I think, is probably something that you as an investor can kind of put away and, and you kind if you wake up in 100 years and the stock will still be there. Are investors, global investors, underestimating the power of a more dovish ECB relative to the rest of the world when it comes to equity performance? So some of the, the, you've obviously had a lot of hawkish comments coming out of the BOE, the Bank of England, um, and, and some commentary out of the Fed as well. So people are saying that you know, there's some hawkish pressure on the ECB. Um, however, from a dovish side, we've had the bank lending survey, which came out recently and showed that there's been increasing you know, pullback in lending or a tightening of credit standards. And you combine that with a small rise in nominal yields. And we've already starting to see some signs of tightening before the ECB's done anything. So um, we've got a, a number of programs that ECB has. Um, they, they're, they, they're going until March of next year. We're also expecting an announcement in December from the ECB. Um, obviously, they've got their, their, their meeting today, but uh, you, you'll, you'll get that December meeting, which is, we're expecting some big announcements. Um, mm -hmm. As I look over to Europe, though, let's just compare and contrast Europe with the United States and, and the positioning of two of the central banks. You know, the the inflation concerns in the U.S. are much greater than that they are over in Europe. Um, and so, you know, the supply chain pressures exist in Europe, but I don't think we've seen the same type of tightness in the supply chain um, in European markets. I don't think you've had the ports as much being an issue there. The second thing is that the labor market is the other element of the inflation equation. And Europe's labor market has been quite sluggish. Um, you know, you just mm -hmm. need to look at the German public sector workers. They were asking for a 5% percent rate or um, your wage hike and it looks like it may not go through so you've got I think a lot less pressure in the ECB um, the economy came out um, a lot you know, behind the US so I think they're also you know, taking the advantage of that and are going to watch what the Fed's doing and then they'll act later.
Well, talking of inflationary and labor pressures for U.S. companies, we just had Caterpillar earnings crossing the Bloomberg terminal. Big surprise to the upside. They beat on EPS by something like 20 percent coming in at 266 a share. And I'm just looking through the press release, and they talk about unfavorable manufacturing costs because of higher labor costs, higher freight costs, higher material costs, and yet sales were really strong. Therefore, they were able to offset that or withstand that to some degree. Did we grossly underestimate the ability of companies to do that? I think that's a company by company decision. I think you're really paying so much attention to this. You have rising costs on one side, and I think that we've been overly focused on those rising costs. But companies can handle rising costs if they can also get the pricing for it. And I think that's what you're seeing with the Caterpillar. They have had those rising costs. But going back to brand name, what you know, construction worker doesn't want to have a yellow piece of cat equipment that there they're riding go. on? <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah. Got but, it. You know, you, People tattoo Caterpillar down their leg. You know, I mean, it's just an <laughs> iconic brand name. And and in, in this case, I think you've got the, the power of the brand gives you the power of pricing. Be careful, Katrina or Tom's going to roll up to Bloomberg uh -huh. headquarters on, on a I'm tractor I'm out in Central on a Park every weekend tomorrow. on my cat. <laughs> yeah. you know, Showing his tattoo. That puppy. We're moving the trees around. Continue, Kaylee. Oh, now I'm just distracted by that image in my head. If someone oh, wants to Photoshop it and put it on Twitter, please, please, do. please feel free. With the tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so Katrina, talking about maybe supply chain bottlenecks, easing, all of these things, we heard from the automakers as well. Ford, Stellantis, VW kind of saying that the worst of it is over. If the worst of it is over, if margins can then expand, if some of these supply chain issues uh, are no longer an issue, does that just mean the bull market rolls on and we can continue to climb higher and higher solely on the basis of earnings, even if growth starts to slow? Um, if growth starts to slow but earnings keep going, you're right. The market should continue to appreciate because it is very much a reflection of the underlying earnings of the companies. Um, in terms of the supply chain, I think what we're seeing is the early parts of the supply chain are starting to get a little more room in them, and that will ultimately work its way all the way through the supply chain. Um, but there are a number of parts where there's still weak, there's still tightness, and you know some of these are, are so interconnected. So think about logistics costs. Um, you know, we used to when we were short on components, we'd air freight them into the factory and that would speed everything up. Well, because we haven't had flights, we don't have belly space, we don't have the ability to do that. So um, I think that some of the logistics stocks costs will be you know, higher for longer, but I think some of the component prices, you're right. I think we've been able to build a little more buffer into it yeah. um, in terms of, you know, and so it, it, the question is, if you've got companies that have gone out with the pricing equation on our, you just need to cover my higher cost, Costs, the risk on that price increase in there is that the companies get pushed back on the other side. So I think you've really got to understand you know, the stickiness of those price increases because right. if they're not sticky, you may not get the earnings growth that you expect. Katrina, thank you for the clinic. Katrina Dudley with Franklin Mutual today as we look at use of cash. Kayla, you look at uh, Caterpillar, and it's just real simple. I'm doing this, folks. 2020 is such an you know, aberration because of the pandemic. 2019 free cash flow was about four billion. Now it's it's modeled next year. It's six billion, and that's that persistency of free cash flow we've been talking about. Yeah, and it's also a question of demand, Tom. <clears throat> demand for Caterpillar products, whether it's branding or just otherwise, is really, really strong. And it's not to say that they aren't dealing with supply chain challenges. They are. The company acknowledging that in their press release and some of the higher costs they are facing. But on the demand side, demand is so robust that they're able to generate enough sales and offset that uh, quite a bit. And it's, so it's really a question of demand. And we've been asking this question, will supply be able to meet it? And it's looking okay, at least for Cal, yeah, Lisa. And again, Lisa, this goes back to Deerfield, Illinois, 97,000 people off the Bloomberg DES screen. And I'm sorry, this isn't Apple or Amazon. It's a boring, as Garbin says, you drop a cat piece, it falls on your foot, it hurts. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is not Amazon. And you have a lot of experience as you drive your tractor around with Vet Bill on the back and your tattoo of Caterpillar down your leg. Look, there's an issue right now of the revenge of the old industrials, the idea here that we want to build things and so you've got to buy stuff to build them. I just wonder what it means for an economy if these <clears throat> companies are able to pass along almost the entire price increase yeah, and then some yes. to the consumer. Then what are we left with, right? I mean, the question is, <clears throat> are we in a better economy or just a reset? 
to higher prices, and then well, the revenues are that much bigger because of inflation. And quickly, Lisa, I'm going to go back to Rebecca Patterson of Bridgewater yesterday, who hinged it all yeah. on the labor economy. Will we see rising wages even with a buoyant employment picture? That's in doubt. Well, and we are seeing rising wages, but will it keep up with the persistency of, frankly, right now, no. margins? And right now, the answer is no. What triggers the reset? Are we seeing some sort of shift in earnest, or are we going back right. to the same regime? We thank Kaylee Lyons for bringing to our attention Caterpillar earnings. Abramowitz, Keen, and Farrell <laughs> would have missed that announcement <laughs> without... It's what Nevis I'm here for, Tom. Lines, <laughs> futures up 10. Dow, Dow futures up 53. The VIX 16.72. Focus the bond market. We'll do that next. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. On Capitol Hill, the head of the House Tax Writing Committee said a proposal for a billionaire tax will not be part of negotiations on President Biden's social spending bill. Ways and Means Chair Richard Neal says there isn't enough support for the measure. He says the House is discussing with the Senate a 3% surtax for those earning more than $10 million. Still, Senator Ron Wyden insists the billionaire's tax isn't dead yet. Post-Brexit tensions between the UK and France over fishing rights keep rising. The British government hit back at France over its proposed retaliatory measures, calling them disappointing and disproportionate. French authorities say they may disrupt the flow of trade with the UK and energy supplies to the Channel Islands due to a lack of fishing licences given to French boats. Airbus has increased its earnings and cash flow targets for the second time this year. The European airplane maker is banking on a recovery in air travel. Airbus is hoping to rally suppliers and customers to support a significant increase in jetliner production. Shell responded to external pressure by setting up a more ambitious target for cutting greenhouse gas emissions from its operations. The announcement came hours after word that activist investor Dan Loeb has taken a $750 million stake in Shell and is pushing for a breakup. Meanwhile, the company reported third quarter profit that fell short of expectations. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. Surrounding our children with people who are vaccinated helps protect them against COVID-19. It's important that we continue to vaccinate as many adults as possible to provide protection to children in the community, especially those who may not be eligible for vaccination themselves. Rochelle Walensky, director at the CDC, and we thank her for those comments uh, today. This is just breaking it now. Pfizer and BioNTech to provide the U.S. with 50 million pediatric doses. That is a stunning statistic when you look at the population of 300 million plus and begins the conversation for November of this year. We get a recalibration on this pandemic now with David Doughty, epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Doughty, thank you for joining us and so well-timed. Where will we be December 1st? Yeah, it's the big question. Uh, I think that um, we're seeing cases go down right now. Um, so there's reason to believe that they might continue to go down. We might be in a better place than we are even now. That being said, we're starting to see cases rise in Europe. Um, and so uh, if someone were to say that, that maybe we're going to see a dip and then a swing back up, uh, I wouldn't well, disagree with that either. I keep, You know, we all have our own statistics we keep. I look at a death statistic in one of the publications, and frankly, I see better news. We're migrating down 1,600, 1,500, 1,400. As you see that glide path, where does it really click in that we're beyond the pandemic, like the Houston Astros were rounding third and heading for home? Yeah, I, I think we should be asking ourselves that question. I mean, 1,400 deaths is still a lot higher than where we were back in, in June, July, for example. Um, but I do think that, uh, that we should ask ourselves, at uh, what point do we say, 
look, um, it's it's time to, to consider ourselves as having turned the corner. Um, cases, probably not yet, but um, but deaths are, are moving in the right direction, especially because the vaccines are, are getting out to, to more and more people. Dr. Dowdy, I could feel frustration rising with public officials that we're still talking about this, that we have a vaccine and that so many people still aren't taking it. Tomorrow is the deadline for New York City workers to get inoculated. Otherwise, they cannot come in. We hear a lot of pushback from firefighters unions and beyond saying you're going to be short staffed. Are these mandates working? These mandates are working. I mean, people are getting vaccinated because they would rather get vaccinated than lose their jobs. I think every city, every company has to make this calculation about um, are, are you willing to, to deal with having, having fewer staff around um, uh, at, the, uh, at the expense of having a safer workplace. So is this the precedent, basically, Dr. Dowdy? And I talk about this with the backdrop of the pediatric inoculations coming to market. You have, uh, you know, the governor, Hochul, of New York State saying, you know what, perhaps we ought to mandate these for schools the same way that we do tuberculosis and MMR. Is this the, re the, the road ahead? Is this the new normal that we have to expect to get to? Or is this distinct, something more akin to the flu? I think for kids, um this may be something something different uh, because kids are, are not people who are getting as sick as as adults are uh, when they get COVID. I do think that the risk benefit ratio is probably positive for kids, but is it so positive that it would well, warrant you, um, broad mandates? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, I want to interrupt here because I think this is so important going back to my childhood and the raging debate at the dining room table over MMR. I get it the children aren't going to die, but isn't there a societal construct, doctor, that we want everyone vaccinated so there's an interdependency, an exogenous solution? Yes, I, I think that that's, that's reasonable. I think we need a little bit more data to see how, um, how safe these vaccines are in kids and how much of that exogenous benefit we get before we talk about vaccine mandates, uh, I think for kids at least. I think we do, um, we are at a place where, where it's reasonable for kids to get the shot. Um, and it's, it's gonna be coming out for, for five to 11 years old. Um, I, I'm not sure we're at a point where we're, we're at um, mandating these vaccines, uh, especially since we don't even have something for, for zero to four year olds. This is fascinating. David Doughty, thank you so much. I learned a lot there here on the pediatric vaccine. I'm sorry, Lisa, that's a hallmark headline as we go back, what, 18 months? Yeah, honestly, to me, the disagreement among health officials, among public officials over what to do with the pediatric vaccines, you nailed it when you were saying ultimately is this a societal issue, the idea right. of trying to reduce transmission, or are we dealing with something that has not been proven, which Dr. Dowdy was saying, we want more data since the threshold is higher because they don't get as sick. This is a key issue, Tom, especially as there's so many adults that have not gotten vaccinated and are still susceptible. Yeah, and you see that, you know, within the hot spots of the country. Let's yeah. do this. Let's reframe right now with futures advancing up 12 nasdaq futures up a solid half a percent here 15,669 on the uh, nasdaq right now but lisa we got a reframe on the bond market and i'm going to go to the benchmark which i've barely talked about maybe a pivot point of 1.54 percent on the 10-year yield and what is this telling us right and what do we pay attention to you asked this question <clears throat> earlier and a lot of people are paying attention to the real yield which you've been also mentioning the idea that it's going more negative more than they are the nominal yields the reason being this indicates the pessimism you know a lot of people they say oh the bears they just get crushed right. again and again they do but is the economy the underlying economy represented in the enthusiasm we're seeing in equities is this something that will catch up with equities no. or is this something that is something that we've got to pay attention to for policy reasons not just claims first look at q3 yeah. gdp today that working survey number 2.6 percent annualizing kaylee lines i'm sorry diane swank was it yesterday or the day before uh, with Grant Thornton, Diane Swank talking about net exports, net imports, and the rest. 
I mean, exports disappeared. That really detracts from GDP. Yeah, and that read's going to be very important for the current economic environment and the read on what is happening right now, Tom. But I would argue that what's happening in the bond market <clears> is actually a reflection of fears of growth further down the line. And if we're dealing with global central banks, that because of higher inflationary pressures, because of supply chain challenges and energy shortages, they're going to be pressured to act sooner and perhaps more quickly than they would have otherwise. Are they getting pressured into hiking and making policy too tight yeah. to soon and are we going to end up with policy too tight coming out of all of the current right. challenges and that's going to choke off growth yeah. down the line. Lisa help me here. I may tear up here because I really miss Farrell this morning. I know you First do. First time I saw John. Thanks Tom. He was on the lawn in front of the old ECB building and I go what is that? You know, this is a few years back. Um, yeah, like a few years back. Lisa, the ECB meeting today, it's not a snooze fest. It is not almost what Lagarde says, it's what she doesn't say that's important. How much she either pushes back on some of the assumptions being baked into the market for bringing forward rate hikes and a curtailing of their bond purchases or not, right? Like what does she do with that expectation? Honestly, I'm struck by the different nature of inflation over in Europe. The people say that yes. they have much more leeway to be dovish. How much can they diverge from the rest of the central banking complex around the yeah, world? I think John would say well said to that that is just really different over in uh, Europe and, frankly, within the United Kingdom um, as well. On the ECB meeting coming up, of course, we will have uh, for you that announcement, 745, about an hour from now, and then an important press conference. You'll see that on Bloomberg Television uh, worldwide. We'll take a bit of it on radio uh, as well. Futures advance up 14. Dow futures not up 100. I'll take it up 85. And the VIX not giving me the love you think you see in the market. 16.60 um, as well. The 10 year yield 1.54%. Uh, what has been a huge tailwind is slowly starting to turn into a headwind. There's a demand shock out there, and we've juiced that demand shock with the last round of stimulus checks. Equities respond generally positive to inflation until it hits a certain level. We think the markets are going to become more challenged going forward. Don't miss out on the bigger picture here. Fundamentals are damn good. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlett, and Tom King, Bloomberg Surveillance, our studios in New York, on radio, on television, across in America, that we'll hear from the President of the United States, scheduled for 11.30 this morning. Lisa, he has a framework to discuss. Yes, we're going to hear about the framework that perhaps they've agreed upon. What this means, though, to me, is the question, does the framework get to the vote for the bipartisan infrastructure plan that's a trillion dollars? To me, that's, frankly, the biggest question, Tom, because it's the most concrete thing that could get done in near term. It's a concrete thing, no pun intended, to get the infrastructure going here. But, but Lisa, what it really showed, thank you. Anytime. What it really, Farrell wouldn't have done that. But what really is important here is the linkage into a monetary structure, ECB more meeting here in one hour, the idea of a monetary structure that screams rates higher. Yeah, rates higher in the front end. The idea of rate hikes sooner because inflation has been so high. To me, the big question of the week, how do you deal with rising inflation in a slowing growth backdrop? How do the central banks address that when the source of inflation is different depending on what country you're talking about? Is it demand driven perhaps more in the U.S. than in uh, Europe where they're dealing with something very much more supply chain driven? Lisa, what's the narrative right now? We're going to get to Greg Peters here in a moment. Thrilled, arguably our most important guest of the day on Global Wall Street, Greg Peters with PGM. But Lisa, I'm absolutely baffled by the narrative out there that Lagarde will need to address here at 8.30. Yeah, well, the question of how much is she going to push back against some of the rising yields lift, how much can she? I would argue that some of what we're seeing in the bond market is synchronized trading, right? We have these momentum traders that are using all front end rates in developed markets in tandem. So how much can she pull back and move the eurozone away from that dynamic that really has gone global, Tom? Lisa, uh, Kaylee, excuse me, Kaylee, I, I want to look at Caterpillar here. I thought you did a great job in covering that here and to pull in the bond market could talk. It's a transitory caterpillar, but I wonder to what? 
It's, it's a good question. I think you are hearing from a lot of companies that the worst of the supply chain challenges are over, or they can at least see the light at the end of the tunnel on the horizon. They see a lot of these pressures easing up a bit for Caterpillar. They talked about everything from labor to materials costs to freight costs, and yet they were still able to report profit. That was 20% above what analysts are expecting. And this isn't just a story we've seen with Caterpillar. By and large, companies are beating to the upside. They are retaining margin. In fact, Bank of America points out the average marketing mar margin expansion is 40 basis points. That's and it is stunning. earnings stunning. that is propping stunning. up this equity market. Absolutely stunning. And again, to Caterpillar and frankly, Deere and the others, it does fold in, Kaylee, to China's slowdown. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think you are also seeing that companies so far, and especially in Europe, I mean, we were talking yeah. with Kat Katrina Dudley earlier about the luxury sector, very vulnerable to China, and yet they've been doing okay as well. She compared them to tech stocks here in the U.S. Yeah, I thought Katrina was really outstanding. Look for that out on Bloomberg Digital, folks. She was wonderful on the persistency of free cash flow that we're going to see. I'm going to start with foreign exchange, a little bit of dollar weakness here. Uh, Euro dollar into the Lagarde statement, ECB here in 42 minutes, and then on to the press conference. Euro dollar 116.07, very much range bound. We've seen that over the last number of days. Yen 113.55. In bonds, all you need to know, massive flattening. We were at 120. We're now at 98 basis points under a one percentage point difference between the two year and the 10 year. Two year yield higher. 10-year yield lower, and I'd also note futures up 14 uh, this morning uh, as well. I need to be briefed. So do you, Lisa Abramowitz. 45 a.m. We've been talking about it all morning. The ECB will plan to deliver their rate decision. Then at 8.30, we get uh, words from Christine Lagarde. To me, how do central banks address inflation rates that have reached the highest going back to 2008, when in Europe, it is met with a labor market that is weaker than here in the United States? At 8.30 a.m., we'll get a read on what we're seeing in the United States. The initial jobless claims expected to come in at a new post-crisis low of 288,000. How much does this give people confidence going into also that first look at the Q3 readings, the idea of GDP that was likely to slow. The expectation is it might slow much more than people think. The expectation is 2.6 percent. The Atlanta Fed GDP now has things much bleaker. They put out a report yesterday saying it might just come in as low as 0.2 percent, which is a market shift downward that is not being <coughs> priced in. And after market, we get earnings from Apple and Amazon. We're going to be talking about supply chain disruptions for Apple, how much has been priced in. For Amazon, we're going to be talking about labor. I think that, Tom, this will be the most interesting aspect of this. How difficult is it for them to fill the 100,000 warehouse jobs that they have open? How difficult is it for them when they're competing with other companies that are also raising well, wages? How much more do they have to hike those uh, wages in order to get people in the Lisa, door? Lisa, I took a photo on 3rd Avenue yesterday. I'm going to say 3rd Avenue and 64th, roughly, as I was walking there to be cut and chiseled like Pharaoh. Of course. And, you know, the, 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 the stretch of boxes of Amazon and the rest literally was half a block long. Yeah, I mean, this this company is crushing it. Can they keep crushing it at a time mm. when, frankly, their mm. margins are going to be squeezed potentially more than other companies, and they got to raise their wages. They've been doing yeah. it. They've been leading the charge. Does it get it done, Tom, as you've asked before? Are you done? Yeah, go. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Lisa Bramwins, thank you so much. Greg Peters joins us right now to say senior portfolio manager at PGM barely describes his authority across all of fixed income. Greg, let us start right now with what the symbolism is of this new hawkish curve and a substantially declining real yield. What is its symbol to you? I think it symbolizes a policy mistake, quite frankly. Uh, it was catalyzed in part by the Bank of Canada yesterday, but there's been a real shift uh, across the globe uh, that seems to demonstrate that central bankers are inherently hawkish. Um, uh, and so what the bond market is telling me, at least, uh, is that there's uh, too much hawkishness priced into the curve. Uh, and um, they're trying to control central bankers, that is, trying to control an exogenous factor such as supply chain issues. So to me, it's quite clear that uh, uh, it's pricing in a central bank policy mistake. Okay, so a central bank policy mistake, and we've seen this being priced into every central bank around the world together in tandem with the disruption that we've seen in two-year yields globally. What do you make of this? I mean, do you think that central banks are on the precipice of an accident, or do you think that markets are getting roiled in a fit of macro traders trying to close out positions? Well, I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest with you. I, I mean, I have been astounded by the, the sudden shift in rhetoric uh, 
out of the various central banks. Um, uh, and so, you know, I go back to Bank of Canada yesterday. I mean, that was a not too subtle shift in rhetoric, uh, same as the Fed. So to me, uh, I do think it's overblown personally, um, but, you know, it's hard to kind of fight, uh, fight the trend here. But I think we're very close, if not already there, to the uh, to to the peak here and where the front end can go, because I really don't see much more scope for two year yields to move much higher here, because it's already pricing in a pretty aggressive Fed policy here in the U.S. Uh, and soon, right? So to me, that just doesn't really kind of add up. So I think we're close to the end of this uh, about here. But ultimately, what's driving the marketplace is the front end of the curve. It's driving the back end. It's ultimately going to drive risk assets. Uh, and so the most important measure to me is uh, focusing on the two-year yield. Well, just, Greg, quickly here, then, there is this idea of what you do with that. Do you buy two-year yields at this point if you think it might be slightly overblown? Rick Reeder of BlackRock yesterday saying that he was sell buying tips, or actually selling tips, because he felt like that was overblown. Are you in the same kind of boat betting against the sea change that we're seeing in markets? Yeah, yeah, so I think it's close. So uh, so we've been short to two-year for quite some time. We kind of looked at it as a free option as the market was mispricing the other side uh, too aggressively, i.e. not enough potential. Uh, so I think we are really close. But it's also important to remember uh, taper is uh, upon us as well. Uh, and the history of taper, while there's not a tremendous amount of data behind it, of course, uh, it does seem to point to lower yields, not higher yields in the belly and the back end. So uh, we're uh, equally as focused on that part of the curve as well. So, um, yeah, so I think the market has moved a lot. Um, uh, the, the liquidity in the marketplace kind of exacerbates the move. Uh, and so it does seem a little overdone in the front end. And I would throw in uh, break even and tips as well. Greg, thank you so much. Your news flow is just extraordinary this morning. Really thrilled on short notice we could get Mr. Peters with us with PGM. Lisa, moments ago, uh, Steve Major publishes out of Hong Kong with HSBC. He says, we are in a game of chicken. And he says, our view has not changed. Must like mm -hmm. the pro uh, Greg Peters, Mr. Major saying, this is about where we're going to be. Yeah, and frankly, you're seeing an increasing pushback to the sea change that we're seeing in the front end. Basically, traders coming out, expecting the Fed to hike, expecting uh, the ECB to follow shortly thereafter. And people like Steve Major say, Whatever they do, they are dealing with the same environment, which is low growth, low inflation, and we're going to get those bond yields back down. He's been a right. bond bull. He's yep. been right. And yep. the, and Kaylee, this is so, so, so important. If you get a Peters fixed income market, if you get the equivalent Steve Major market, it says equities up. What do we do about Q4 earnings for equities in January of next year? It's a good question. I mean, the bulls will tell you that earnings are going to continue to drive the story on the Life equity side that up. we are seeing margin expansion. And yeah, status quo, stocks go up, stocks go up, whatever you want to call it. But I actually caught up with Stephen Major earlier this week because, yes, he raised his target on for 2021 properties? Nice. on the 10 year. Yes, early in the morning at 5 a.m. It was late in the I'm day for up. him in Hong Kong. But he went to one and a half for 2021. He's still back down at 1% in 2022. Next year, Tom, he says, we're coming down to me. Lisa Bramas, quickly, your comment on Greg Peters saying this is it for the two-year. That's actually what we're hearing from a growing number of traders. And the idea that Rick Reeder came out yesterday and said that he is actually buying, uh, selling tips. He is selling the inflation mm -hmm. story. He thinks it's got, he's gotten over its skis. No word if they're reading Steve Major in Frankfurt, Germany. We'll find out here. We've got the ECB announcement. I'm not sure what we'll see there, but what we'll really see is a press conference as Lagarde manages, well, the empty seat at the Bundesbank and also Christine Lagarde managing the message between dovish and hawkish tones in Europe. Futures up 16, Dow futures up 91, the VIX 16.53. Stay with us on radio and television. This is Bloomberg. With the First Word News, I'm Laura Wright. President Biden heads to the Capitol today to brief House Democrats on his social spending agenda. Hours before he heads to Europe, the president wanted to have an agreement when he arrived in Rome for a G20 summit. But House and Senate Democrats can't agree on how to increase taxes to pay for the measure. 
In Taiwan, President Tsai Ing-wen says she has faith the U.S. would come to the island's defense if China tried to invade. That's a comment that's bound to irk Beijing. Tsai told CNN the threat from China is increasing every day. She also confirmed the presence of U.S. troops in Taiwan. CNN says there are fewer than three dozen American service members there. The price of European natural gas and power fell today after signals from President Vladimir Putin that Russia will send more gas to the continent next month. Putin has told Gazprom to start refilling its European gas storage facilities on November 8th. Benchmark Dutch gas for the next delivery topped as much as 12%. One of the founders of Palantir Technologies has started a furious debate on Twitter about parental leave. Venture capitalist Joe Lonsdale tweeted that any prominent man who takes six months off with his newborn is, quote, a loser. His tweet came in response to one about U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who took time off to care for his child. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. Everybody in this country that has been blessed and prospered should pay a patriotic tax. If you're to the point to where you're able to use all of the tax, tax uh, 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 forms, if you can, to your advantage and you end up with a zero tax liability, but have had a very, very good life and you had a lot of opportunities, there should be a 15 percent patriotic tax. Senator from West Virginia, a lot of attention paid not only to him, but to a select others in this legislative battle. It's a battle the President of the United States will address at 11.30 as he manages the message on to Rome. Maria Tadeo and Anne-Marie Horton will be in Rome for, I believe it's the G20. Lisa, is it G20, G7, G42, <laughs> G20? G20. Okay, you got 20. Thank you. G G I'm distracted by Lagarde and ECB mm -hmm. here in less than 30 minutes. Right now, paying patriotic taxes is Josh Wingrove, Bloomberg White House correspondent. We're thrilled that he could join us uh, this morning on this framework uh, that we have. Greg Vallier, Josh, comes out and says it's happy talk. I know the Republicans will say it's happy talk. Are there Democrats that say that this framework is happy talk? Yeah, I mean, I expect uh, that we're moments away from Democratic senators or House members coming out of the woodwork and saying, but actually, or oh, wait, you know, we, we're not <laughs> sure about X. And that is the case. This is, a, you know, generously speaking from the administration's perspective, they uh, have some sort of framework that Biden hopes to announce in detail that they expect, presumably, Democrats will get behind. But, you know, they're, they're quite notably not saying that it is a final deal. They're quite notably not saying that everyone has signed off, in particular, you know, Joe Manchin and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, so, it, it, you know, whether this is a slight turn of the screw, uh, an even slighter yeah. turn of the screw, or a big breakthrough, I think, is really, really unclear right now. But obviously he wants to be able to announce something or update something, <clears throat> at least, before he heads on that trip to Europe. Josh, we all have our teachers that change our lives. One of mine was my eighth-grade history teacher, Mr. Brunel, who actually said to me history could be fun. And it was a great civic class. Is any of this that you're living right now Civics 101? I hope you just didn't give away a password for a banking login there, Tom. You know, that feels like a good one. Your favorite <laughs> teachers. Security uh, yeah. question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, they're going to be to and fro on this, and they have been for months, and there are really core issues at play here. It includes taxation. It includes Medicare. Uh, it includes paid family leave, which looked to bite the bullet uh, and, and fall out uh, last week. A night, but then, of course, progressives are, p are pushing for it. That's, of course, a measure uh, particularly supported uh, uh, as a, for the care economy side of this, and women in particular would benefit from that. I mean, there are just so many moving parts on this. Joe Biden is trying to sort of, you know, force it into one yeah. pile on a plate, but we just we just don't know. We just don't know. It's it. It's, well, it well, is an evolving one. And there's a question, too, of who the president is speaking to when he gives this address. Is he really talking to lawmakers? Is he talking to the domestic population saying, don't worry, guys, I am doing what I promised I would do during the campaign? Or is he talking to the G20 and to the conference of the parties as well when we look forward to COP26? 
I think it's threefold. I think it's all of the above. One of the things that there has been agreement on among Democrats are some of the climate provisions. It's possible that he could, you know, specify those in particular so that he can go overseas on this trip and show that the U.S. is serious about doing something uh, on climate as, you know, he wants to do. So there's that one. Uh, the American public, I think he definitely wants to give a sign of progress. Remember, those Virginia elections are coming mm. next week, and there's a fear that Biden's popularity is sinking and might... Uh, actually dragged Terry McAuliffe down with him, so there's that. And then third, it feels like my, almost a heavy hand type of approach might uh, be tempting to him here, where he goes up and announces a deal and boxes in Democrats a little bit or tries to to sort of get on board uh, one way or the other with the, with the commander-in-chief. And that hasn't really worked so far, so whether they've gotten far enough to make that work now, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. But it, it, is, it is a sort of multi-pronged audience. Yeah. But would he be speaking today if he weren't leaving for Europe? Hard to say. Right. Well, hard to say or no. I mean, honestly, Josh, <laughs> yeah. this is the issue. Is these, there are all these false deadlines that have been created. Kaylee brought up the progressive wing, and this is actually crucial in determining what the importance of a framework is. Does it get uh, the Senate, does it get the House to a vote on bipartisan infrastructure, which really a lot of people say is the main goal heading into year end right now? Right. And, and heading into this weekend right. where you know certain sort of funding measures are, are set to expire if there's no deal on infrastructure and at last count no i mean the progressives have said that they will not take a framework or handshake deal or back of napkin whatever in lieu of an actual vote and they are not going to let the house okay. bill or the house vote go forward on that infrastructure bill until they do so no right now the, these two are locked in tandem and whether they both get off the, off the ground remains unclear, but Biden is going to try to give them a boost today. And so to dovetail this into the question of the audience that President Biden is speaking to, there's a domestic audience and there's an international audience as well on the, pre the beginning of G20. Yeah. Is the United States united? How does he send that message if he gets nothing done? I mean, how much does this put the United States at a disadvantage diplomatically heading into these discussions? Well, I think, I think that they would argue that you know, no one does, sees no progress here. But, you know, everyone abroad knows that this is a divided Congress. I'm sure Joe Biden, just like Donald Trump before him, would love to have the power that a lot of prime ministers in the G7 do to sort of just ram stuff through parliament yeah. uh, uh, well, without much much fuss. They don't have that power here. Yeah. But, yeah, he is, Joe Biden has said, look, autocracies are watching. Incidentally, yeah. the G20 has a couple that he would consider autocracies uh, are watching right. to see if Democrats or, if, excuse me, democracies can do you know, right. big stuff fast and well in the 21st century at a time when we need to do it. Uh, and he's expressed real doubt about that. That is part of the reason he's pushing for a deal and looks set to announce that they're close to some sort of half a loaf uh, that they can get. But you know, the backdrop here is the more stuff that falls out of this bill, you got to wonder, do progressives just say this isn't worth it? This is too watered down. Why are we bothering? And we just like give up entirely. We got we to continue this conversation. Josh Wingrove is not in Rome. He's in Washington, our White House correspondent. We make note of that this morning. We've got a great team going to Rome uh, to see what G20 comes up with. There'll be some interesting uh, tones there as well. Lisa, right now, let us begin really an in-depth coverage of ECB. Holger Schmieding coming up is outstanding. He's the one guy I wanted to talk to about this with Berenberg Bank. But to me, Lisa, as you mentioned earlier, I believe it was you, inflation over there is totally different than the angst over here. It ha isn't being driven as much by the demand side, right? I mean, we go back to what Rebecca, Rebecca Patterson of Bridgewater said yesterday, that in the United States, there has been so much cash put into savings accounts and people are deploying that cash. How much do we see a different picture in Europe, the idea that it's being driven by the supply chain disruptions without the labor market that's quite as strong as the United States? This is a huge dilemma for the ECB, Tom. And a real distinction, everyone hanging on the words at 8.30 of... Uh, uh, Madame Lagarde, yeah. as she tiptoes around mm -hmm. her interpretation of their split interpretation uh, on price change, and of course, with all the historical legacy across the ECB as well. We do want to remind you this afternoon as well Apple and Amazon, it has become home. Kaylee, how do you digest Apple, Amazon? How do you do that quickly? With Amazon, it's going to be for the cloud. With Apple, how much did supply chain issues weigh on the third quarter? Can people get their iPhone 13s and their new Macs and their Apple mm -hmm. Watches? And how much is that going to be a problem in the guidance as well? Looking forward to the holidays, Tom. Ben Laidler reaffirms today there's a massive underestimation of revenue growth. Coming up, Holger Schmieding as we look to the ECB in 20 minutes. Stay with us.
Good morning, everyone. Global Wall Street comes to us for a cross-asset data check. We're going to do that right now and then get to the equities with Ms. Lines. Futures advance, that's what you need to know. Up three, up four. S&P futures now up 14. Dow futures up a sprightly 72 uh, points. We're not on 36,000 watch, but there it is. NASDAQ up six-tenths of a percent. That gets my attention. Even small caps rebounding after a really difficult final hour uh, yesterday. The two-year yield a solid 0.55%. Uh, That's extraordinary. We'll dive into that in a moment. 30-year bond well under 2%, 1.93%. Oil with that 86 level on Brent crude comes back. 83.08 down 1.8%. I'm Brent Crude and Foreign Exchange. I can't figure it out in the screen. My eyes are glazing over. Let's get saved by Kaylee Lines <laughs> to on the, the equity market. Tongue. Go, Kaylee. This is what I'm here for. I'm keeping it really simple this morning. Earnings winners and earnings losers. On the winning side, Ford reported after the bell yesterday, really blew it out of the water. Analysts pointing to a number of positive surprises. They raised their profit forecast. They're reinstating their dividend. They're weathering the chip shortage actually okay, better than other automakers did in the third quarter. That stock is up about 9.3% before the bell. A couple semi companies wolf speed kla corp also beat expectations in the quarter wolf speed analysts really positive on the guidance they gave that stock is up 14 percent mm -hmm. and of course we were talking about caterpillar earlier on in the show they are facing those supply side pressures labor materials freight costs that's all true but they had really strong sales that help offset that and profits beat by 20 percent higher than what analysts were expecting so that stock up about one and a half percent some companies not so lucky though you have a number that actually missed expectations one of them being twilio Revenue coming up short. That stock is down 14%. Upwork Flex also misses. They're down 7 and 5.4% respectively. And eBay, this is kind of an interesting one, Tom. I know that you probably were on eBay bidding for antique Absolutely. guitars or first edition books or whatever oh, it is that you were bow seeking. Ties. Bow ties, of course. Killer. That would be it. Maybe you were doing that during the pandemic, but maybe you're doing less of it now that the world is opening back up and you can actually go into thrift stores or antique stores or wherever one finds bow ties these days. So they're because off eBay the mark. Is seeing interesting, interesting. EB, EB, yeah. eBay is seeing its active customers actually go down, and as a result, holiday forecasts coming up short. That stock is down 5.7% before the bell, Tom. Kaylee Lyons, thank you so much. This is a joy. It's 7.32 Wall Street time. We are on our way in less than 15 minutes to an ECB meeting. He was a senior economic advisor at the International Monetary Fund and in a PhD dissertation tried to piece together his Europe. We are thrilled to bring you this morning Holger Schmieding, Chief Economist, Berenberg Bank. Holger, I was lectured once long ago that American economists do not do the medium term. We do short term, we do long term, and we leave the medium term to fancy people like you in Europe. How does Christine Lagarde navigate the short, the long, and more importantly, the medium term in her press conference today? Well, what is good for her is that she will most likely not have to announce any serious decisions today. So she can instead focus on setting the record straight a bit. And for now, that means that the ECB with regard to the medium-term inflation outlook, is not very concerned. The ECB, on the guidance it provided in September, did look for, of course, further upside to inflation near term, but for a significant easing of those pressures again and just 1.5 percent inflation in 2023. And as a result, the ECB's guidance did not imply anything like mm -hmm. the rate hike for late 2022, which markets have started to price in. And I think Lagarde will say, yes, near term, inflation is even a bit more than we expected in September. Right. But our medium term outlook has not changed materially. A delicate question, but I know you can give perspective. Is Christine Lagarde advantaged or disadvantaged here by not being an economist? Well, she presides over what probably is one of the biggest and among the best uh, collection of economists at the European Central Bank. It's sort of one of the best that we have anywhere in the advanced or entire world. So she can draw on a lot of experience and probably in her job, her skills of bringing different views together, of amalgamating them, are quite useful. And all in all, we have to say that so far, the ECB under Lagarde has been a somewhat steady shock. And that 
all in all, is not bad. I think she will find the roughly right words to explain that inflation is an issue, but that markets have been a bit ahead of themselves and that inflation is less of an issue in the Eurozone than probably it is in the U.S., where fiscal policy is much more expansionary. Okay, so, Holger, this is the issue, right? You said there is a whiff of stagflation in the Eurozone. Yes. Why is the whiff of stag stagflation so much more intense than here in the United States? It's one basic reason, namely that the Eurozone is more dependent on industry, on industrial exports, on manufacturing. And as a result, the supply shortages that are crippling parts of industry in many parts of the world matter more for the Eurozone than they do for the US. Also, consumer demand, which is fairly good in the Eurozone, is of course even stronger in the US because in the US the government has helped to raise and improve private household balance sheets very, very nicely over recent years, and you could say probably by too much. So there is not as much um, consumer demand in the Eurozone as there is in the U.S., where we have arguably a bit too much of it. So this is the confusion to me when I take a look at the euro that's actually holding in. It's been gaining versus the dollar over the past couple of sessions. Shouldn't it be falling out of bed if the ECB is going to remain on hold far longer than any other developed market central bank out there? In a way, yes, but this is not exactly news that the ECB faces less of an inflation problem and thus will stay with its current rates for longer. Also, the dollar is to some extent a risk on risk off currency. And that means in a risk on environment where markets seem to be looking ahead to some extent to the easing of shortages in 2022, in what <clears> feels <throat> a bit more like a risk on environment, the dollar typically gives up some of its safe haven gains. Mm. So I would not say that this is much of a mystery. Well, there was a point in time where the euro was one of the biggest concerns for the ECB. That 120 level was very concerning. We are now past that. It's the bond market that maybe causes most of Christine Lagarde's headaches. Do you think she is going to have to try really hard to talk it down today as she has in the past? I think she will try to talk down a bit, especially these short end moves starting to price in ECB rate hikes for late 2022, which at least according to ECB guidance are highly unlikely. As to the norm and overall financing costs remain favorable, she will probably warn that the ECB would go against moves which it deems excessive, but probably not say that the current level of yields is higher than the ECB would think it should be, and thus she will probably not announce that the ECB is going to lean against very much what has already happened, just probably trying to slow down further rises in yields. Holger, this will be one of the two final meetings for Jens Weidmann as he's stepping down as the head of the Bundesbank. Does that mean he's going to make more of a hawkish push before his exit? What is the impact of that? Well, I think that he will, of course, or very likely, have made today and make in December his case, which is basically we ought to stop the emergency uh, purchases comparatively fast and we ought to start thinking about the long-run outlook with a need to raise rates eventually. He will make those points. But he has made those points in the past. Mm -hmm. And because he is a bit of an outsider in many of these ECB debates, I don't think that um, his intervention over the last his last two sessions will have made a crucial difference relative to what it did in the past. It always influenced decisions, but only a bit. And then we have to look forward to what his successor will do, which I think may be a bit less hawkish, but may resonate yeah. than well better with the overall ECB. The parlor game of Europe with Holger Schmieding. Thank you so much, Dr. Schmieding. Greatly appreciate it, Chief Economist at Berenberg. And, and Lisa, this goes back to John Arthur's tour de force this morning, uh, talking about the hawkish dawn that's out there right now. Boy, did Greg Peters and Steve Major push back against the hawkish dawn. How do you decipher near-term versus longer-term structural shifts in inflation dynamics? It has to come from the labor you can't. market. Uh, yeah, I mean, exactly. You, you, exactly. Ultimately, you can't look at just the input prices. There is such a bigger dynamic. And the shifts, and you've talked about this so much, Tom, the idea of automation. We don't understand some of the <clears> shifts and the transformations in the labor market. How do you game this out? I mean, honestly, you're feeling that confusion in all of these diverging prog uh, I mean, prognostications. I mean, there are ways to go there with that good observation, but at least 
that the bottom line here is everybody that I respect is saying you've got to look at the labor dynamic in Europe and, frankly, over here as well. And in the, in the corporate earnings announcements, Lisa, I just don't, I don't see the labor inflation entrenched. There and may be parts of it. I wonder if the, really the, the zeitgeist is shifting right now among the population that are seeing the inflationary pushes. If all of a sudden the tolerance with very dovish Fed, with very dovish ECB policy is becoming less so as people sort of see what they're paying at the grocery store or for a car. And that, I think, is a shift oh. that we have to see Christine Lagarde push against, perhaps, to keep with the same kind of rhetoric we've heard from her. We go down in flames, folks. We tried to stay away for three hours this morning on Radio on television. From what? From the dreaded T word, transitory. We go there with Kaylee Lines right now. Kaylee, transitory. At the end of the day, it's still there. I thought it got canceled. I thought we were over the transitory <laughs> narrative. Or at least, culture. It got at canceled. least the market canceled transitory. That certainly, what the market is telling you, what the bond market especially is telling you, is that they are no longer buying in to that narrative. But that is one that time and again, Christine Lagarde has tried to push. And Lisa has brought up the point that maybe the inflation dynamics are just truly that different in Europe. But I would imagine we're going to hear the word transitory or some variation of it coming well, from short Christine term. Lagarde. Short, short yes. term versus long there we term. Go. You know, I think Synonymous. Doug, Doug Cass was on fire yesterday on Bloomberg Radio in the 9 o'clock hour. And I think if Cass and you buttress that up against Peters and what we see from Steve Major and others, and that's what makes this debate so interesting. It's a constructive surveillance narrative. Stay with us in three minutes. An ECB decision. Yes, a framework <laughs> from Lagarde. This is Bloomberg. With the First Red News, I'm Laura Wright. Well, Kaylee, one thing that won't be cancelled is an image of Tom Keene with a caterpillar tattoo. But in the US, President Biden is set to announce that there's an agreement on his economic agenda. Bloomberg's learned that the president will announce that Democrats have agreed on a framework of tax and spending proposals that he's optimistic Congress can pass. He'll go to Capitol Hill and brief House Democrats on the deal that negotiators worked out with him. Later, the president will speak at the White House. Post-Brexit tensions between the UK and France over fishing rights keep rising. The British government hit back at France over its proposed retaliatory measures, calling them disappointing and disproportionate. French authorities say they may disrupt the flow of trade with the UK and energy supplies to the Channel Islands due to a lack of fishing licences given to French boats. Shell responded to external pressure by setting a more ambitious target for cutting greenhouse gas emissions from its operations. The announcement came hours after word that activist investor Dan Loeb has taken a $750 million stake in Shell and is pushing for a breakup. Meanwhile, the company reported third quarter profit that fell short of expectations. Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick has asked the video game makers board to cut his compensation until the company meets gender related goals. Kotick made more than $154 million last year, most of it in stock awards. His new compensation would be a little more than $62,000. Last week, Activision failed to convince a California court to temporarily halt a sexual harassment and discrimination case. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. You're going to still have inflation accelerating. I think a lot of people who are then going to be looking forward the next 12 to 24 months are going to be looking at a decelerating growth picture, both earnings and GDP. So I think early next year is it's definitely going to be a tricky time for the market. At 8.30, we focus on the U.S. markets and that decelerating growth. GDP, really a frontline statistic. Right now, though, it is the ECB. And what is so important here within the tens of headlines that come out, is the euro pretty much solid, 116.11 on the euro. I've seen barely any change there in all these headlines. We'll let them stream by on television. What you need to know on radio is it is the serious managing of the message by the ECB. And what I don't see out there, Lisa Abramowitz, is one of those hallmark Draghi-like headlines talking about 22 
or 23 or indeed 2024. Do you think that Christine Lagarde wants to make headlines today no. or wants to just no. keep things Precisely. the way they are? Because right now things are just <clears throat> going along and she can kind of ride this train and it gives them maximum flexibility. She wants to make no headlines. This is a good start. They're not changing anything. Really, it depends on 830. There's the words. There's a lot of adverbs here as well. Moderately, we're seeing as well. Inflation may moderately exceed goal for transitory period. There it is. Kaylee, that's yeah. pretty good. I have no <laughs> idea what I just said there. No, what they, do you think? I mean, we knew it was coming, right? This has been her message. She's staying on message. It's been the message of the ECB. It's one I'm sure Christine Lagarde will reiterate. <laughs> and to Lisa's point about not wanting to make any headlines, does that mean Christine Lagarde doesn't feel mm -hmm. the need to push back on the market and the pulling yeah. forward of expectations? Or will she push back a bit and say, we're not actually going to hike by 20 basis points by the end of 2022. We noticed yesterday, I can't cite who told us the range of euro very, very tight. And right now, again, 116.13, fractionally on pips elevated out to four digits as well. Right now, and this is a joy, we're going to rip up the script. Mark McCormick joins us. He has been absolutely brilliant on dollar resiliency, global head of FX strategy at TD. And yes, we'll talk about euro. We'll talk about the U.S. dollar, the president with 1130, talking about fiscal America. But what I want to talk to Mark McCormick about is the fun and joy when the facts change, I change. And yesterday, Mark McCormick, you got a love note from the Bank of Canada that the facts had changed. What is it like on the TD desk when the facts change, as you saw from the Bank of Canada? Yeah, thanks. Uh, the interesting bit is uh, most of us aren't on the floor anymore, so it's uh, it's taking the facts as they come in from work from home offices. But it, you know what you saw from the market is is what I think people are really focused on is what the Bank of Canada and what the Bank of England have done is they're pulling things forward. And I think what the markets are really focused on is what's the R star, what's the terminal rate, how do these cycles evolve over the next year, year and a half versus who moves first and who moves fastest. And so what we know right now in the G10 is the Norges Bank, the RBNZ, the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada are first and they're primary. And the Bank of Canada basically said to Sturt traders yesterday, April is a live meeting. What I think matters for the FX market, though, is really how does the how does the rate cycle evolve over the next year, which actually hasn't changed. So I think that's a big dynamic, especially if we look at the Bank of England. Um, you know, we've priced them in the fastest over the last six weeks or so. But again, are you going to see much more than two or three hikes in, in a year? And we've already priced that in. So that's a big element of whether or not these moves are sustainable. Uh, for some of these other currencies on the central bank trade. So, Mark, let's just go through what's been priced in. Bank of England moves first, Bank of Canada follows, then the Federal Reserve, ECB coming in dead last. Is that basically entirely priced in to uh, currency markets at this point? Absolutely. And I think when you think about it as well, like the first one in here was the Norges Bank. So I think, you know, what you have to think about in the context of this is we've got central banks, uh, what we call the hikers, We've got basically growth divergence, which we call the growers. We've got the miners, which is basically your terms of trade. And we've also got positioning and valuation. So those four factors is what's driving FX. And so if you've got a negative view on the terms of trade shock, which was bad for Asia and bad for Europe, and a rotation outside of that where we don't get another 25% jump in oil prices in the fourth quarter, then Norway is really kind of vulnerable this environment given how much excess has been priced in. And the euro, you know, give or take positioning, euro positioning short, but euro should be trading around 115, 114.50 on our high frequency models. You basically have an environment here where euro knocky could rally kind of reversing some of that. And you could also see euro sterling starting to, to come off the lows because the Bank of England's been fully priced in. And we're actually long uh, dollar CAD because we don't think the Bank of Canada dynamics changes some of those other forces that we're talking about in terms of, you know, growth divergence, terms of trade and what's uh, currently priced it. So, Mark, the short term is easier than the long term, right? The short term is who hikes first is a competition where you kind of have that horse race going on longer term. It is a much harder story and it's difficult to see one economy diverge meaningfully from another when it comes to growth <laughs> and inflation. How much is the idea of a flattening yield curve indicating a global policy error that's going to affect the ECB, that's going to affect the euro region, even if they hike last, basically that one central bank cannot escape another and that the currencies are sort of toggling a lot around this reality. Yeah, it's a great point because we've got kind of three, I guess you call them inflation themes. You got stagflation, reflation and 
you know, the, the word that no one wants to talk about is deflation, but there is an element here that the bearish flattening of yield curves is suggesting that monetary policy around the world, two-year front-end rates, whether it's U.S. or non-U.S., you know, first, what we've seen is a non-U.S. average of emerging markets in G10 has ripped about 50 basis points in the last uh, month or so higher. U.S. yields are, are finally following. They're up about 15, 20 <clears throat> basis right. points. But there's an element here that the worry is bearish flattening is indicative of weakening growth. And, you know, you can okay, see some Mark, yield curves have flattened. I got to interrupt. This is too, too important, folks. We're going to go math here, and I can do that with McCormick, ex-Bloomberg. Mark, are you suggesting, for example, with a 10-year U.S. real yield, we have a fan distribution of outcomes that leads us to a persistent, constantly negative real yield? Exactly. Yeah, your skew is biased negatively. Um, so your 10 year real rate is, you know, essentially, if we think about it in fair value terms, maybe has, you know, 20, 25 basis points to move higher. But if we go back wow. to the taper tantrum, we had a 100 basis point move because we had a three standard deviation mispricing on real rates. We don't have exactly. That same well, Mark, I, again, I don't want to interrupt, but this is absolutely critical. Answer the question then, which is simple with a three standard deviation move. How does this filter through the American financial system? Well, I guess uh, the big part of it is real rates, the plumbing of risk premium and the, re and the plumbing of interest rates stays at very accommodative levels. And if you look at it, a global uh, version of financial con conditions weighted by global GDP is still the most accommodative it has been in the last 15 years. So the, the under, you know, the plumbing of the financial system, you know, while we're talking about how many central banks have hiked rates and, you know, where we're removing stimulus, we are still an emergency stimulus measure and real rates are still very accommodative for reflation, which is a theme that I think should still probably do quite well in the first part of next year, uh, especially since we're not looking for a Fed hike uh, until 2023, which, again, would keep real rates at bay as we see short-term inflation rising, uh, but essentially decelerating into 2022. Mark, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Mark McCormick with us here today. We need to continue. Lisa, we're not going to do it now, but we need to sum up some of those thoughts of Mr. McCormick Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, that we heard here in a bit. We are 30 minutes away from a set of announcements, claims, the first look at third quarter American GDP and Lagarde from Frankfurt. Stay with us. These expectations for rate hikes next year for the Fed, they're pretty seriously overcooked. It does seem like the economic cycle is moving at warp speed. Some central banks are trying to push back against this market view of where rates are going. It's either going to be higher inflation for longer than what's priced in, or it's going to be a Fed that has to catch up. Bottom line is you can't expect to turn off a global economy and then just ramp it back up overnight. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. The uncertain path to a new normal. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio, on Bloomberg Television. Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz. Jonathan Farrow, on a well-deserved day off. I am not going to call it a sabbatical deserved. and be, uh, I'll be charitable. <laughs> Kelly Lyons very much in the Caterpillar seat driving this morning. And Tom, I really do look at the fact that central banks are in the hot seat as they try to gauge higher right. inflation at a time of slower growth. In 30 minutes, Lagarde, she's got a lot to address. And the headline just breaking across Bloomberg here on German inflation coming in a little bit above. And that's a ginormous number for the psychology mm -hmm. and culture of Germany. 4.5% estimate out to 4.6%. And then you've got, Lisa, the key statement I see within all the mumbo jumbo of the ECB, the stuff Pharaoh's expert on. I don't know why he does it. He stays up late at night to do it. <laughs> Rates at the present lower level out there somewhere, Linda Ronstadt song, out there somewhere <laughs> is 2% inflation. It's there. Well, this is the issue that Out basically the market somewhere. is pricing this in. I'll let you keep singing, Tom. But basically people are saying we are going back to a normal of low inflation. And this is what is supporting risk assets. The irony of a bond market that has a bearish outlook I, I on the just, future actually edifying what we're seeing in stocks, Tom. This is perfect. Kaylee, this is perfectly framed. A red headline in the Bloomberg of 4.6% German inflation 
And out there somewhere is 2% inflation, according to the ECB. And the ECB is looking for it on a sustained basis. They're not going to move on policy until they get around that stable 2% inflation target. And we heard it again with the lines, the headlines coming out of the ECB moderately above target for a transitory period. My question is really going to be how Christine Lagarde navigates this in the press conference. What is her tone like? How does she push back on this messaging and push back on what we've been seeing in the bond market, the full pulling forward of hike expectations? The market says in 2022, end of year next year, the ECB is going to be at negative 30 basis points. It's going to be 20 basis points higher than we are right now. How does Christine Lagarde push back on that idea. And Kaylee, this is the conundrum of four central bankers where you've got a recovering world. You've got, frankly, companies that are passing it along and are doing fantastically, even in Europe. And then you have these economic projections that really fly in the face of that. How do you message that and thread that needle? Well, and I think it's going to be difficult for Christine Lagarde, too, because she's working with outdated inflation forecasts. We aren't going to get an upgrade to those forecasts or revisions to the forecast until December. So how does she kind of navigate that messaging and set the stage for for that December meeting, which is going to be crucial, not just for the reason of the forecast, but also what it means for what comes post PEP, Tom. Data here, 27 minutes towards a lot of activity. Thrilled you're with us on radio and television this morning. Futures, hour, two hours earlier, elevated, now more elevated. Futures up 12, down futures up 55. And the VIX, I, you know, I sort of like a 15 VIX. I got a 16.73 VIX. In the bond market, we've seen a move. Off easy ECB announcement, the anticipation of what Lagarde will say in 26 uh, minutes, and that is from a 0.55 to a 0.53 two-year yield. That sharp curve flattening, a little less than what we saw <clears throat> uh, as well. And I've got Brent crude, $83.38. To sum this up, the cacophony of news here at 8.30, Lee Ferris joins, head of macro strategy for North America at State Street. Lee, is the glass half full or half empty as we look at American GDP at 8.30? I think when it comes to GDP, um, sadly it's half empty. I think this was meant to be the big reopening phase, you know, Q3. Expectations at the start of this quarter were, you know, this was going to be a 7% quarter, you know, as things really got back on stream. And, and now we're looking at a median of, what, 2.5%? Atlanta Fed saying 0.5, which I think is on the low side. But, but even so, it, it's a far cry from where the expectations were at the start of this quarter. And it really shows what, what Delta has done and the supply side constraints you were talking about, what they've done to activity. Are we at a point, Lee, where, and I think of the great Bettina Dalton at Fidelity years ago, where all that matters is domestic final sales. And that country to country, and here talking about the U.S., that we see the export-import mystery and the China mystery so great that all we can fall back on is U.S. domestic final sales. I think there's a point to that. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point, Tom. I think, you know, at the moment we're trying to gauge the strength of the domestic economy you know, with supply chains, with all the stuff at the ports, with, you know, with everything else going on, you know, the, the, the sort of external sector of the economy is sort of something we can't control, right? Um, so, yes, I think there is a, a, a valid point that we should be looking at final sales to domestics. Um, and that's a better gauge of where we are in terms of the, the bigger picture and the reopening. The other stuff, yeah, I mean, there's so many moving parts right now in, in the global economy and the U.S. That, that it's hard to really gauge where we are. I don't think we get a clear picture till next year, I'll be absolutely honest with you. Okay, Thank Lee, you. who is glass half empty, right? I mean, you look out at stocks, they're hitting new highs. You look out at bonds, they're doing all right. There is a bearish tilt there. Who has it wrong with how bearish they are in terms of <clears throat> U.S. growth? Well, Lisa, you're assuming there's a relationship between asset prices and the real economy. <laughs> surely, that, surely that broke years ago. Um, <laughs> okay, well said. Carry on. So, I mean, here's the thing, right? So, so, you know, low growth now, more support from policy. You know, Fed, you know, you, you talked about at the top of the show about, about how much is getting priced in in, the, in Europe, in, in the U.S. as well. We have virtually two hikes priced in next year now for the U.S., after this, this round of uh, sort of tightening in the market over the last week or two. So, listen, weaker data actually pushes out that scenario. And we know that policy has been the big driver of asset prices. Wait, hold on a Queuing second, Lee. A very low this, is, this is really key. Are you saying that we are still in an environment where bad news is good news in terms of markets? Yes. 
The longer we get the policy support, then the, be the better for markets. The longer that policy support is there, as long as the economy is not going to recession or anything disastrous. But, but if things are delayed, if, if we're going on the right path, but at a slower pace, which means the policy support persists for longer, still positive for markets. Yes, overall, yeah, because more policy support. But what you're seeing in the bond market is the anticipation that policy support will not persist for longer. We're seeing a pulling forward of expectations on when the tightening starts across the world. It's already started in some places, and the equity market's still resilient. So is that not a mismatch? Yes. I, I mean, there's no doubt there's a lot of mismatches going on at the moment. I mean, the, the fact is, you know, look at the curve shapes, though, right? So, so we brought mm -hmm. forward these rate hikes. But then if you look at the, the, the longer end, yields have actually dropped back down. So what yeah. we've seen is this massive curve flattening. So, you know, it's sort of, we're sort of mixed between the two at the moment in so much as, as, as we're bringing forward these rate hikes on the back of the inflation numbers. But actually, when we look at policy over the long term, we expect it to stay easy. Okay, so let's talk about that curve flattening. 530s right now, 75 basis points between the two. Has that been overdone? Yes, I think it's tough, but I think it's more to that do with the short high. end. The, the, the rates going up, I think, is, is the bigger issue. I don't think central banks are going to act as hawkishly as anywhere near as what the market is sort of projecting at the moment, particularly the sort of G3. Now, some of the commodity exporters, Bank of Canada, we saw yesterday, yes, they can be more aggressive. They're getting tailwinds from these commodity prices in their domestic economies. But commodity importers generally and the G3 economies I don't think they're going to deliver anywhere near what the market's pricing. So I would say that, yeah, the flattening's been overdone, but it's been overdone because short-term rates have gone up too far rather than long-end rates coming to it down too far. Very good. Lee Ferris, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it with State Street, head of macro strategy uh, this morning. We have so much going on here in 21 minutes. I really want to focus uh, right now, Lisa Bramowitz, on the U.S. data. Claims has been my most elegant chart. It's got a wonderful vector towards somewhere out there, a fully employed America. And then not the three looks, but the first look at Q3 GDP yeah. is a set of mysteries. Yeah, the set of mysteries is a good way to put it, especially with the Atlanta Fed GDP now coming out yesterday at sub 0.2% growth for uh, the third quarter. What does this mean? I mean, let's say we do get a really negative GDP preprint uh, for the third quarter. What does that do for markets? What's the reaction if Lee Farage is right, saying that there is a complete divorce between the two, markets and the economy? I'm trying to wrap my head around that, Tom. I'm struggling now, here. And the struggle I have is the technology of America. Kaylee, let's go to what we'll see this afternoon. Again, look for our coverage at 4 p.m. on these important tech earnings. Mm -hmm. After Microsoft, after Google, I'm sorry, Kaylee, the prism at 4 p.m. is different. Yeah, it'll be all about the cloud for Amazon because Amazon and Microsoft are the two major players there. The question is, Microsoft's results were so strong. Does that bode well for Amazon? Or does that mean maybe they were actually taking some market share? And with Amazon yeah. as well, we have mm -hmm. to consider about kind of, while we're talking about supply side issues, labor and the labor pressures that Amazon is facing. The supply side issues for Apple are really going to be more about can they get enough devices to meet demand? If you don't have an iPhone 13 in your hand after you ordered it a couple months ago, would I just then wait for for the iPhone 14? I mean, at what point do you draw the line and wait no, for the next upgrade cycle? The, if you don't have an iPhone 13 in your hand, you're not cool and you can't do 5G to watch Pitch Perfect. That's what I've learned <laughs> uh, very much. But you into the Keen House. Analog a 13 year old has spoken. Analog, analog, analog <laughs> Rana of Bloomberg <laughs> Intelligence, Analog and Digital made uh, 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 worldwide headlines yesterday with us, our Apple expert here. And he says, look, unit sales are underestimated. Dan Ives at Wedbush said, Saying just flat out people have it wrong on the growth of these tech juggernauts. Ben Laidler reaffirms today his optimism as well on revenue growth, not only in tech, but across all. It is, an is exceptional, too. Yeah, an exceptional eight o'clock hour. No other way to put it. Lagarde at 8:30, Michael McKee with American Economic Data. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Laura Wright. President Biden is set to announce that there's an agreement on his economic agenda. Bloomberg's learned that the president will announce that Democrats have agreed on a framework of tax and spending proposals that he's optimistic Congress can pass. He'll go to Capitol Hill and brief House Democrats on a deal that negotiators worked out with him. Later, the president will speak at the White House. 
In Taiwan, President Tsai Ing-wen says she has faith the U.S. would come to the island's defense if China tries to invade. That's a comment that's bound to annoy Beijing. Tsai told CNN the threat from China is increasing every day. She also confirmed the presence of U.S. troops in Taiwan. CNN says there are fewer than three dozen American service members there. The price of European natural gas and power fell today after signals from President Vladimir Putin that Russia will send more gas to the continent next month. Putin has told Gazprom to start refilling its European gas storage facilities on November 8th. Benchmark Dutch gas for the next 12 months delivery dropped as much as 12%. Caterpillar posted third quarter earnings that beat estimates. The world's biggest maker of mining and construction equipment reported demand for heavy machinery that outweighed concerns of supply chain issues. Meanwhile, higher labor, freight and materials prices drove up the manufacturing costs. Carlyle Group capitalized on the strong deals market to bring in a record $14 billion from asset sales in the third quarter. The firm's private equity business delivered most of the proceeds. The sales helped drive Carlyle's distributable earnings to a record beating estimate. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Laura Wright. This is Bloomberg. I'm sure that we have seen the worst. So uh, Q4 should be much better now. We should be sort of the worst, and then we should see an increase uh, of semiconductor supply, uh, basically quarter after quarter. Matthew Miller in conversation with Mr. Dies of Volkswagen, uh, really managing the message there on chips and on the rest of the Germanic manufacturing challenge. We've got so much going on this morning. We've got Lagarde in 12 minutes. We've got Michael McKee with key economic data. We thought maybe we'd take a breath right now and talk to an adult on tech. There's too much talk that I think is off the mark, and you do not get off the mark with Daniel Flax. He's senior research analyst at Newberger Berman, but far more dark in the door at T. Rowe Price years ago is their tech analyst, and that is a shingle of a claim. Dan Flax, what does the street get most wrong about Apple and Amazon? Tom, good morning. I think what they get wrong or underappreciate with Apple is just this extraordinary pace of innovation that we've seen uh, for, for really decades. If you think back to the iPod, of course, the iPhone, uh, <laughs> Mac, they, they continue to reinvent with the new silicon. Uh, the wearables category, I think, in a lot of ways is just getting, getting started. Uh, what, what I would say in terms of what they perhaps don't appreciate with Amazon, again, a company that is obsessed with innovating and delivering value to customers. You've seen them enter and really define new markets like the cloud. And we see extraordinary growth for Amazon and for Apple over the next several years. But what's so important here is that phrase, several years. You know everybody's looking out six months. Maybe they go to June of next year. Cantor, Charles Cantor 101 at Newberger Berman is give me the five-year time frame. Where are these two flagship companies of America and the world, frankly, where are they in 2026? With Apple, I think what is going to be a much bigger part of the story in 2026 is what they're doing in healthcare. I think we're already seeing signs. You have the ECG or electrocardiogram uh, app in the, in the watch. Uh, the, the phone allows you to measure walking steadiness. We know uh, for, for a lot of people, being able to monitor how effectively they walk is, is incredibly valuable. Uh, we, we know Apple is doing a lot of studies across a wide variety of, of areas with partners in terms of uh, women's health, mental health. Uh, there's a lot of areas where they can make a big difference to their users' lives. And of course, we all appreciate in this new world that we're living in, health, fitness, it's, it's more important than ever. With Amazon, I would tell you that what we think can happen over the next five years is that their logistics operation will continue to grow in both uh, scope and, and the ability to get you packages even faster. This, this notion or the ability to get you packages in hours, Tom, really helps to redefine the, 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 um, uh, what people can come to expect. The other thing where we see a much bigger opportunity is in their advertising business. 
This helps yeah. um, merchants really reach their customers. So a lot to like over five years. How about their cloud business, considering the fact that, as Kaylee was mentioning earlier, it's becoming a duopoly between Azure and AWS. Has that been adequately priced into the stock price? We actually see a much bigger market than just the two of them. So, for example, I would highlight Google Cloud, the Google Cloud platform, which has also seen strong growth. Amazon is a leader, Microsoft Azure is a leader as well, and both of them have continued uh, to execute very well, and we see very strong growth, uh, really for all three of them over the next five years. What I would say is that the, the cloud opportunity in many ways is still in its infancy. When we speak to customers, the, the ability to really become more agile, innovate, create, try new business models, all of those are multi-year drivers for the cloud. And if Amazon in this instance, or Amazon Web Services is able to innovate and deliver value, we see extraordinary multi-year growth prospects even from here. Dan, I want to bring it back to Apple because I am fully bought into the ecosystem. I have a Mac, an iPad, AirPods, Apple Watch, you name it. And I actually oh, broke my Apple Watch back in September and everybody said, wait for the new model, get the new one. I didn't because I had no confidence I would get it quickly and I'm glad that I just bought an older model because I don't know if I'd still, to this day, have a new watch. How much are those supply chain issues going to be an issue for Apple trying to meet the demand that may be there but supply that maybe isn't? I think supply is an issue. I think it's going to remain that way uh, for, for several months to come. It's of course been an issue for much of the year. I think what's going to matter over the, over the next one to two years will be whether they can execute on product cycles. So we've seen with the new watch, and of course it, it's going to take a little time to get it into everyone's hands who wants one, is that the, the screen size increase of nearly 20% really allows for a richer, more immersive experience. And so there is potential for some sales to get lost uh, due to the supply chain, but I think the longer term story, I think the innovation and really the, the, the healthy product cycles is going to matter more over the next couple of years. But on the subject of innovation and product cycles, Apple upgrades their products often. I mean, we get a new phone, iPhone every single year. If they're having kind of issues with the iPhone 13, was does that not create an effect where you just don't end up seeing demand for that phone because people are going to wait for the next model that's only coming out, you know, less than a year from now. What we saw with the iPhone 12 was despite severe delays, uh, given COVID, given the, 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 the difficulty with supply chains globally, they launched it very late, but sales were extraordinary because it was mm -hmm. the innovation in the product. I think we're likely to see something similar this year in terms of the iPhone 13 was actually introduced a little bit earlier than the 12 was. Sure, their supply chain delays, demand in the early days seems healthy, but customers want to be able to get the very best product that they can. And right. so I think most will look to buy it if right. they're able to. Dan Flags, get me an iPhone 13. Goodbye. <laughs> Dan Flags of Newberger Berman. Thank you so much for so being kind. with us this morning. This is so important, 8.30, six minutes out. We've got to jump to Michael McKee now because we've got McKee really important data, then Lagarde. What beneath the headline data on this GDP number is, has your attention? Well, a lot of people haven't focused on the idea that the inventories uh, have been okay. a big issue. They've been declining for three months in a row, and that's a subtraction from GDP. And if the supply chain issues are continuing, then right. manufacturers are running down their inventories. The manufacturers running down. This sounds like Jan Hatzius 101, also the export dynamic as well. How important is domestic final sales away from all that mumbo-jumbo? Mumbo well, we're hoping that's what keeps the economy afloat, along with business investment, but we're not exactly sure how much it translates because because business orders have gone up, but shipments have not gone up as fast, and it's shipments that go okay. into GDP for current GDP. Oh, this is fun. Michael McKee with us here, and he does such a good job of really parsing this out. It's much, much harder than you think in real time to do this. We're sort of making jokes and all this, and McKee's actually looking at it, and it comes out in dribs and drabs, and uh, we'll do that for you before we go to Christine uh, Lagarde. Lisa, it's just the oddest thing. It's not like it's two Americas. It's it's like it's 14 Americas. Yeah, especially. And then there's corporate America, which is operating in its own sphere entirely. The idea that they're able to pass around along the price increases, and yet we are seeing this slowing growth, this slowing trajectory of a recovery that is really posing a conundrum for the central banks. I don't know what they're going to do in terms of messaging <clears throat> that forward. Kaylee, you really nailed it with a watch. I'm sorry. You know, we make a joke about it, but that's the way it is across everything. Yeah, I talk about supply stuff. chain issues too much to have any faith in anything <clears throat> getting to me in a timely manner, Tom. Again, 
Again, five minutes away from the Lagarde press conference. More importantly, five minutes away from the state of the American labor economy. A first look at Q3 GDP. Stay with us on radio, on television. This is Bloomberg. Good morning to all of you. Bloomberg Surveillance, Kaylee Lines in for John Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen. Coming up on economic data, and this with futures up 14, the 10-year yield 1.53%, the shock of lower yields in the past two, three, even four days. Economic data will stream out here at 8.30, and certainly a first blush of claims is a good statistic. Michael McKee joins us to parse the dribs and drabs as it comes out. Yeah, well, Tom, we're looking at the uh, jobless claims falling again, 281,000. The survey was 288. So jobless claims continue to improve, and it looks like the economy uh, is beginning to absorb some of the people who were on the sidelines. GDP is out. The only number that we have yet that I am seeing is the uh, overall headline number of a 2% gain, which is much weaker than and the 6.7 percent we had uh, unrevised in the prior quarter and uh, lower than the 2.6 percent forecast. But we are looking now for the first release uh, and uh, we're getting it uh, in, as Tom says, dribs and drabs as uh, the Internet um. is a little bit slower way of uh, reporting this than we used to have. Personal consumption up 1.6 percent. That's better than the nine-tenths forecast, but it's way down from 12 percent in the third uh, quarter, uh, the second quarter of the year. Uh, the GDP uh, price index, 5.7 uh, percent. So, uh, Tom, this is interesting. You and I have talked about this before, the difference between nominal and real GDP. Uh, inflation rising at more, almost three times the rate of real yeah, GDP. Yeah, you know, Michael, as you look at the numbers here, and, and let me talk to you while you continue to digest the numbers. I'm trying to find domestic final sales to see the spirit of the domestic American economy. But, but Michael, to me, Lawrence Summers is looking at this screen and going, this looks very staggy, very inflationy. Well, that's going to be the the issue. A lot of people are going to be talking about, does this support the stagflation idea? And I think you have to say uh, it supports deflation idea, at least for right now. We don't know how long inflation is going to remain elevated. But we are seeing signs in the more recent indicators. Remember, this is a backward look at the third quarter in more recent indicators that we are getting some growth back. And we're expecting especially consumer spending to rise again. Now, I've got the numbers in front of me here for uh, our spending, and it shows that durable goods spending, spending on stuff, fell 9.2 percent, uh, while services rose uh, on the month by 7.9 percent. So we are seeing that shift from uh, buying stuff to buying experiences. Uh, the other number that everybody wants to know is non-residential fixed investment, and this is a big drop, 1.8 percent, 9.2 percent in the prior <clears throat> quarter. So business is not putting as much money into the economy. Right. And I mentioned that with shipments, Tom. A lot of people can't get their stuff, uh, and that's, right. that's a problem. Uh, exports down 2.5 percent. Yeah, we learned uh, that with the trade. While imports so, were up 6.1 percent. Yeah, yeah. So we can see why the trade deficit okay, this, uh, this falls is, the way it does. You keep digesting, folks. Lagarde speaking. We're going to get to that in a moment. Lisa Brambwitz, I just really want to point out my first look at the headline numbers is we're going to see an American media in the next 24 hours talking stagflation. Yeah, the idea here that this edifies the idea of higher prices, faster inflation, and slower growth. What do the central banks do with that? Just want to give you the response in markets. As you would expect, actually, longer-term yields in the U.S. do come down a touch. The dollar strengthens just a touch, nothing to really write home about. But what you do see overall is this feeling that the Fed is going to have less of an incentive to hike as quickly. You see the two-year yields also come down. And that, frankly, we are moving back to a normal that we does actually resemble what we used to see. The idea here now, the 30-year yield, 1.94 percent, and the 210 spread actually contracts even more, Tom. The idea here of slower growth ahead and these price increases are not actually uh, completely uh, benign when it comes to the growth outlook. I do wonder, Mike, after you parse through these numbers, if you come away with a sense that the Fed is correct, that, they play, uh, that markets are wrong in pricing in so many rate hikes. 
Yeah, I th well, I think uh, the two problems there. Right now, the markets may be wrong because we anticipate a rebound in the fourth quarter. But it's also because of the nature of this whole thing. It's also impossible to know exactly how the economy is going to behave going forward. I mentioned before we went into this that I was going to be watching inventories. Inventories after three months of decline actually rose right. during the month, $90.8 <clears> billion. <throat> so that adds to GDP. Right. Now, we talk about how companies can't get uh, their stuff, but it does uh, suggest that maybe right. things aren't as bad as they appear going forward. Michael McKee, as we segue to Madame Lagarde, how important is it for her in Europe to have a buoyant American economy? Well, it's very important because we're an extremely important trade uh, partner. And the more we grow, the more demand we're going to give to Europe. So that's important. She's got the same problem that uh, Lisa just brought up here, pushing back against the markets, saying, you got to raise rates, well, you got to raise rates. She's out doing what the Mike McKee job is. Lagarde channeling Michael McKee. Inflation pressure should ease in the course of 2022. She goes on optimistically to say the grip of pandemic on economy visibly lifted. Higher energy prices may reduce purchasing power. She stole that from Lisa Abramowitz. Let us listen to the president of the European Central Bank. 